It's my pleasure and honor to invite to Living Histories, Professor Reggie Kuruvilla from Johns Hopkins. Please tell us about Living Many Interesting Histories. Well, thank you, Sri, and thank you to the Living History team for inviting me. I obviously did not read instructions and have no slides. So I'm just going to talk uh, for a few minutes about my uh, background and experiences that describe my trajectory. So um, similar to Rana, I had a rather unconventional route to academic research. So sorry to back up. Uh, I'm a professor in biology in the department uh, in at Hopkins. And four months ago, I started as vice dean for natural sciences at the School of Arts and Sciences at Hopkins. So I've had a rather unconventional route to academic research. I grew up in Kolkata, India, in a family of limited means. So although my family valued education, I had no role models or mentors or obvious paths that pointed to a career in research. I did not even know that it was possible to work in a lab um, and that someone would pay you for doing it. So, um, uh, and I've always been fascinated by the intellectual curiosity and the logic that drives scientists, even as a young child. And I was, uh, and I had some of those traits in school, but I didn't know how to turn it into a career. So um, I was surprised by how similar my trajectory was to Rana. So I became a science teacher, a chemistry teacher in high school. But after a few years, I realized that I needed training to address the questions that I was interested in. And this propelled me, in fact, a friend told me about applying to graduate schools in the US. Uh, I was accepted to do my PhD at the University of Houston. And from my very first research experience, I was fascinated by neuroscience. So I worked on diabetic neuropathy on rats as a model system, and I found that defective fatty acid metabolism in the lipid sheets that surround the nerves contribute to nerve defects in diabetic neuropathy. So this was my first realization that the nervous system plays an important role in a prevalent metabolic disease. And it's ironic that 20 plus years later, my lab has returned to studying the role of the nervous system in glucose metabolism and pancreatic function. Uh, my full appreciation for neuroscience research culminated with my experience as a postdoc uh, with David Ginty in the neuroscience department at Johns Hopkins. And there I made several key discoveries in understanding how neuron development is shaped by interaction with peripheral organs like the heart or the pancreas. Uh, so I showed that growth factors secreted by these peripheral organs control neuronal development through the cell biological mechanisms of endocytosis and long distance transport. So this led me to my independent faculty position at Hopkins, which I've held for the last uh, 18 or 19 years. Uh, now my lab studies a part of the nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, most people are familiar with it because it's responsible for your fight or flight responses in the event of danger or stress. or when you have to give a talk and you realize that you have no slides available. Um, and we uh, this was a field that was largely studied by physiologists, but we brought new life to this field by studying this at molecular and cellular levels. Uh, we've approached this question of how neurons and peripheral organs interact at different levels from biochemical studies um, to cell biology to doing whole organ imaging of how axons innervate the target organs and using mouse genetics to understand uh, the function of the sympathetic nervous system. So our focus has really been to understand the sympathetic nervous system in its entirety. Um, a fundamental property of uh, animals is to maintain an internal, is to keep the internal environment constant in the face of a continuously changing outside world and the sympathetic nervous system is vital for this process. Uh, and it, there's growing awareness from, uh, from clinicians that a dysfunctional sympathetic nervous system contributes to several pathologies such as chronic heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. But this part of the nervous system is still relatively understudied compared to the brain. Um, and we are very excited to keep working on understanding how the 
nervous system interacts with the rest of the body. The sympathetic nervous system acts as a major conduit for communicating between the brain and the rest of the body. So this is an area that is uh, that presents tremendously important uh, problems, both at the fundamental scientific level and also in a more translational level. Um, to, um, so there's a lot more to be discovered in this fascinating area, and uh, we're really excited to continue working. So for take home messages to um, early career scientists, just like the previous speakers, I would say follow the questions that you're curious about. Uh, don't be swayed by whatever is fashionable at the moment. Uh, do not stress out too much about your career by comparing yourself to others. Compare yourself to you five or 10 years back, and you'll be pleasantly surprised to see the the sharp trajectory, and I had to learn this again and again because I would make myself miserable comparing myself to others. And then I realized if I looked at myself 10 years ago and said, you've done, a, you've done a good job. And lastly, I would say always advocate for yourself and, you know, never hesitate to advocate for yourself. And always we are scientists. When you advocate yourself, back it up with data. So sometimes we walk into... Um, you know, our supervisor's office or asking for a raise, but we don't do our homework. And my advice to junior folks is always do your homework, get your data and present the facts when you advocate for yourself. So I'll stop here and be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Reggie, for an inspiring uh, living history talk. Uh, on behalf of the audience, I am uh, clapping. Uh, audience, please send your questions to me via chat. Let me start by asking you, uh, would you please um, fill in some of the uh, the the some of the story, some of the drama in being a little in going from being a little girl in Calcutta to where you are now? Did you see this as your natural trajectory or did a series of um, left turns lead you here? It's uh, the latter. So I think it's always, um, my MO was to just survive the next step. And so, and sometimes it was taking one step forward, 10 steps backward um, to kind of get to where I am. So I really want to emphasize that, you know, it. it's, but at the same time, and I think the one thing that kept me going is I would get really mad when there were obstacles or and I, I, I would not want to be beaten down by the system or be uh, beaten down by the process. So I would get really frustrated and angry and come back determined to give it another go. So I think that probably helped. Thank you. A uh, question from the audience. What's your advice to individuals in marginalized groups who are trying to forge a career in science? Yeah, I think it's, you really, uh, I mean, I, you know, I'd hate to speak. Um, I, uh, different people come with their own experiences. Um, and I, I'd hate to speak for, marginalized groups as an entire block, because as Rana mentioned, the immigrant experience is very different from belonging to underrepresented groups who grew up in the US. So it's very difficult to put all the marginalized groups into one block and say, this is the advice I have. And I think the key thing is, you know, build pure cohort groups, um, have support groups, you know, family, friends, and my uh, peer support group were other immigrants like myself that I, you know, we could share stories of being far away from our parents, of not seeing our parents for five years or worrying about visas. So I think that each person based on the experience will have, you know, have to rely on their own peer support groups and, and mentors. Um, 
Thank you. Um, taking one more question from the audience um, before calling it close, um, which is, did your experience as a teacher inform the flavor of the research you do and of your mentorship? Not so teaching in India is very different from teaching in the US. Uh, you, I, you know, uh, so so that probably didn't help too much. But I I'm on the undergraduate campus at Hopkins where I used to teach undergraduate students and graduate students. And I think that allows you to explain your message uh, in a much more digestible way. So I, I think teaching undergraduates at Hopkins really helped me to give better seminars because I realized that you have to make your talk uh, much more accessible to a diverse audience. Uh, wonderful, thank you again for taking these questions for the inspiring talk. I am going to uh, close the recording